Welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast, a show for anyone wanting to level up their travel hacking lifestyle. I'm your host, Julia Menez. I'm a travel hacker, coach, speaker, Filipina American ENTJ who loves solid travel gear and using shortcuts on spreadsheets. On this show, I'm on a mission to bring you travel hackers from all walks of life to help you level up your travel hacking game. We dive into credit cards, miles, points, strategy, mindset, and the secrets behind how to travel the world for next to no cost. So let's get hacking. My wife and I were trying to have kids for years. We couldn't, you know, we ran into some issues. We were looking here in the United States. And for anyone who is going through infertility, you know, the I'm sure you've seen the, or people have seen the cost of it. It's like twenty five or $30,000 per round. It can be more in some locations. For that includes medications, procedures. So it's really expensive in a lot of locations to do that. Not everyone can afford that. My mother-in-law worked with some people up in the area where we, where we live who actually flew to the check for IVF. So we were like, let's pick their brains on this because we want to know more. And the cost over in the check, which the clinic was great. The doctors were very knowledgeable. They speak like 20 different languages. So it's not just you know US and you know speaking Czech. It was like $4,000 out the door. So for the procedure that included everything with medication, so you're talking, what, one, one-fifth to one-eighth the cost. So if it wasn't successful round one, which is a real possibility for people, you could do it again and still be saving yourself some money. Hey there, points people. You just heard a clip from Dustin Waller of Waller's Wallet. Dustin's YouTube channel teaches viewers how to find the cards that work best for them and how to make the most of their points with award travel. In this episode, Dustin and I discuss how he grew his points YouTube channel and also the magic of points and miles and how they helped him and his wife grow their family by making in vitro fertilization more affordable by traveling abroad for the procedure. If you love Dustin after hearing this episode or really anyone I feature after listening to their episode, please remember to always reach out and ask if they have referral links that you can use to support their work whenever you're ready to apply for your next card. Never, never, never apply directly through Google because then the banks get to keep that commission money. If you would like to support this show when you sign up for your next card, you can find my links at geobreezetravel.com slash cards and in the show notes. Also, make sure you use someone's referral link when you sign up for different apps and tools. When you sign up with Flues using my referral code Geobreeze Travel Podcast, you will receive three vouchers to earn up to 35% cash back on merchants such as Grubhub, CVS, and more. You'll also earn a high cash back voucher for each friend that you refer to the app. And if you would be interested in hosting a paid collaboration with Flues, send me an email at julia at geobreezetravel.com letting me know that you're interested and I will introduce you to the marketing team. Check out the show notes to download the Flues app. Thank you to Flues for partnering with us on this episode of the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. Hey, Dustin, welcome to the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. Hey, Julia, how's it going? Thanks for having me. It is going well. I am very excited to have you here and to hear all about your YouTube channel and all of your points and miles knowledge. But before we get into all of that, tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into the game of points and miles. Yeah. So before I even got into points and miles, I was a pharmacist and I was graduating pharmacy school. And I got into the points and miles game when I was looking for a way to make my honeymoon just a little bit cheaper. So because honeymoons are just stupid expensive. And I just stumbled across a couple points and miles blog back in like 20, 2012, 2013. And just started diving down this big rabbit hole of the points and miles world and eventually just got sucked in. So fast forward, you know, I stay, I'm, I stay home with my, both my sons. I pick up shifts every now and then just to keep my pharmacy knowledge, you know, active. I run, I run my YouTube channel, but ever since that first honeymoon trip where I paid $15 for my airfare, I've been hooked ever since. Where was your honeymoon to? Jamaica. Nice. And give us all the details about what airline you flew, how many points did it cost, what cards did you get to get those points. Tell us all the details. So this was way back when the Chase Sapphire Preferred had a 40,000-point bonus. So I had the 40,000-point bonus. I didn't really learn at the time. I didn't know a whole lot about transfer partners at the time. So I actually booked through the Chase Travel Portal at the 1.25 cent per point value. And we flew United. I was direct from Boston to to Mont- Montego Bay. And it was 15 bucks out of pocket after we burnt our points. Pre-learning about points, we actually booked our hotel. We went at a Sandals resort, which we say now going back, we would never do that again. If we knew what we knew now, we would never do that. But at the time, it's what we booked, it, which was, I mean, it was a great experience. But 
United on the way down, perfectly good flight. Although I lost my cell phone on the flight, someone stole it. So my entire honeymoon, my iPhone was just gone. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So no photos or like, what were you doing? Really not a whole lot of photos. At the time, my wife had this really crappy slider phone, which it was like, remember like the old web browser, like you would hit like N because you'd be charged like $2 a minute on it. So like, it was, it was decent pictures, but I had like, I think it was like the iPhone five at the time, maybe what what it was four, four or five, but it, it slid down when we landed and someone totally took it because I couldn't find it on the plane at all. That's not the best honeymoon story I've heard on the no, show. No, well, the rest of it was good. The rest of it was good. Just it started off pretty, pretty stressful. Yeah. Well, that's a fun first point of my trip. So after that, at what point did you just dive deep and say, I'm going to grab all the cards? It was probably a year later. I started really digging into it because I was still being cautious. I didn't want to open too many cards without having a way to meet minimum spend requirements. So I was opening one card here, one card there. And then after a while, I said, hey, I feel comfortable with this. I feel like I know what I'm doing. It's time to really dig into this because, I mean, the banks were just giving away points at the time. I mean, it was just so easy to open three or four cards at a time, do these app aromas, and just earn hundreds of thousands of points. What was a mistake that you made early on where you want to tell listeners, hey, kids, don't do this? For me, it was manufactured spending. And I know it's like this like dark world of points, if you will. Like if you can't manufacture spending, you can earn all these crazy points. So this is way back when the, the blue card or serve card was around and people were getting these pretty regularly. I was liquidating some gift cards back when a city had that 100,000 mile point AA executive offer on it with a $10,000 spend. So I was earning points to take my mother-in-law to Hawaii. And I was like, we're going to, I wanted to book a first class ticket on American Airlines at the time. That was a partnership they had. So I was at a register liquidating it. And there was a glitch at the register. And I, the money had come off the gift card, but was not loaded onto my serve card. So after going back and forth for a couple of minutes, they said, you need to call our corporate office. I called their corporate office at least a half dozen times and never once got a phone call back. So just like, I lost 500 bucks. And at that point, I was like, that's it's taking up a lot of my time to run around to all these stores, buy these gift cards. I lost 500 bucks. Clearly, I suck at this. So I'll just, I'm just going to give up on this. Yeah, manufacturer spending, a lot of people are like, oh, this is like the answer to how people get all their points and miles, I guarantee you it is not the answer to how most of us get our points and miles. Most of us like travel for work or we do some kind of buy and sell stuff. I do business stuff on the side. Some right. of us just have high spend and a high enough income to cover it. They're, buying and selling is going to be a lot easier for you. If you're, if you're going to have to go get a gift card and then like figure out how to turn it into a money order and then like loaded onto a prepaid debit card or something else like you're driving all over town you have anxiety it's stressful people are behind you in line at walmart yelling what are you doing what are you doing oh it's and annoying. you hear these horror stories too of people who are like well i went out and i bought five or ten thousand dollars in gift cards how do i liquidate them and where i live in in maine there's no place to liquidate really if you wanted to so I don't know. Like a lot of people, it sounds like who do this don't necessarily have, not everyone has like the, the cash to float 10 grand in gift cards to kind of spend down. So I always tell people like, if you want to do it, you need to start slow and find something that works. If you find it, you don't tell a single person what works for you. <laughs> yeah. And that's a good point too, because I have gotten you guys some sad, sad DMs on Instagram being like, I'm out $6,000. What do I do? And I'm like, I don't know what kind of answer you think I can conjure for you right now, but I do not have the answer to that. If you bought $6,000 worth of gift cards from Staples to earn five points per dollar and your liquidation plan doesn't work and you do not have $6,000 in the bank to cover that, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to pay interest and that's going to completely negate the 5X points that you just earned. And only ever only ever buy gift cards of what 
you can afford to just lose. If it all just gets lit on fire, you have right. to be okay with that. Like I always tell people, like if your manufacturer spending, I, I consider like a gamble, right? Like mm-hmm. you have to be okay with potentially losing that money or finding an alternative way that may cost you money to liquidate that. You know, the was it 80 cents at Walmart to make money orders? If you can do that even still for some people, it's super cheap. But if if you have to pay a three percent fee to liquidate those, yeah, that sucks. But it's better than sitting on thousands of dollars of gift cards that you you know, it's going to take forever. It's going to take a lot of dollar menu McNuggets or whatever to get rid of those. Yeah, I don't buy thousand dollars of gift cards. I post every time I go on a Staples run or something and people are like, how are you liquidating? I'm like, no, I just, this is my shopping money. I, I use this to buy things. I use it for Amazon reloads or if I want to shop at a small business that none of my other cool hacks and stacks and like, 5x coding is going to work on that. I'm going to use those Visa gift cards. I sometimes just like donate them to charity or something like that. I will buy random things with these gift cards. And I like to have a few hundred dollars on hand for just random shopping things. But that's what I do with them. And, and I'm not going to hold more than a thousand dollars of this at one time. Yeah. I mean, if you do it that way, you're just earning 5x basically for all your regular spend, which is great. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes people worry about like, well, you know, I want to get rid of those cards as soon as possible or use my card for here. But, you know, I know people are like, well, I want the protections for this or that. Like nobody really worries about your protections when you're going through the drive through or these small minute purchases. You know, if I'm, if I'm buying a big electronic, I'm going to put it on a card that gives me some sort of protection. But yeah. for a lot of day-to-day expenses, not having those protections is not the end of the world. Yeah. If I'm buying a sweater, I don't need purchase protection on a sweater right. that costs me yeah. $40. Right. So. All right. That was a really long tangent to say, do not manufacture spend things that you can't afford to lose using an Amex prepaid gift card or anything else. Nailed it. Yeah. All right. So that was at the beginning of your journey. At what point were you like, I'm going to make a YouTube channel about this? And what does that look like? Yeah. So I was actually blogging for a while and I stopped blogging. And then I was actually writing for a couple other places And a friend of ours was, I was doing like a video consult with them essentially going like, Hey, what what are your travel plans? Let's talk about some cards that would work for you. Like a couple weeks later, he was like, you should start a YouTube channel. And at that point I was, I'd never thought of YouTube as a medium to talk credit cards, points and miles, travel, anything along those lines. It just was never something that came up in mind because everyone was a blogger. I mean, blogging was what you did, right? It, It seemed like what people did. And I thought about it for a little while and decided, you know, I'd give it a shot. So at the time I had my, I think I just had a, I forget what I had for a camera. It wasn't a, it was just a regular camera I had lying around. And I just wrote a couple scripts and I just shot and I edited on my wife's old iPad Air, which would lock up because how much RAM I needed, just it didn't have the capacity. So it took me a lot longer to those video edits. And I just did on like iMovie for free until I learned some of the basics and then slowly upgraded some things as I started making a little bit of YouTube money, if you will. But it, it, it for me, my process is basically I write out almost a blog post now and I record in my office and I just edit it down. So it, it, I mean, the entire video process takes somewhere between four to six hours in its entirety for one video. How long are your videos? They range from about eight minutes to about 15 minutes, depending on what's being covered in those potential videos. And four to six hours is a long time. Because I'm trying to think of like my podcast editing time, where for a 40-minute episode, we record for about an hour. I cut out some stuff. We'll record the intro separately and then like splice in a couple things listen to it once. So that takes another hour to mark up all the edits. And then I outsource it. I have a podcast editor. And oh, that's nice. Yeah. So I pay a guy on Fiverr $25 to edit each of my episodes. So like my time for each podcast episode is probably, I don't know, two, two and a half hours for See, each 40-minute episode. I used to pay an editor to do it. But every time, because I put a lot of screen. So like for video, I put screenshots in. I put in visuals to go along with just the words. That takes quite a bit of time depending on what you're showing. You know, an award travel video, you've got to record the screen afterwards or as you're doing it, put it in, cut it wherever you screw up. That just happens. And then go through it. And I watch through and I do the chapters. I used to have an editor, but he would, 
I'd have to kick it back to him like three or four times to ha- to fix it. And by the time that was done, I was like, I could edit it myself faster than what he's doing this for me. So it wasn't any time saving. So I would love to hire an editor again because it was su- it could be a good time saving uh, measure. But at this time, I'm just editing myself. That's rough. All right. Yeah. So how did you grow your audience when you said, I'm going to go from blogging to YouTubing? Did you already have a blog audience where you just wrote to them and said, check out my YouTube? Or how did you grow an audience? It was very slow. So I did not have a very big, large blog presence. My SEO skills are very, very minimal for blogging. Um, I was actually blogging over at Running With Miles for with Charlie for a bit of time. And he made a blog post that I basically I was starting a channel. So I had a little bit of follow there. Some friends and family started. But I mean, I went days without views, days without subscribers. I got really, I tried to get better with my thumbnail presentation and really pointed content, if you will. And then I had one content creator reach out to me. He's like, hey, I like your stuff. Do you want to work together? And he, at the time, his channel was about 10 times the size of mine. I had like 500 subs. He had like five or 6,000, which was huge. And I, I really do believe like that moment was big for the channel because while I may, while he may not have been like the largest channel at the time, that one collaboration ended up giving me like 300 subs over two days. And from there, my channel just kept growing at a pretty consistent pace. And it's, it's been pretty consistent anywhere from about 600 to 1,000 new subs every month. So I, I think that collaboration, honestly, I, I deep down believe like that collaboration really changed the trajectory of the channel. Collaborations are definitely where it's at. And I know that I rant about this a lot on the podcast and on Instagram that it's been so siloed for the whole experience of Points of Miles where people don't link to each other very often. We're all very protective of our affiliate links and I just don't care. Uh, no, so. no, I totally agree. It's really hard to like, it. sometimes it feels like it's very clicky. Like if you're not in with this group of people, you're not going to get the link back even if you you know, broke the story or made the the post on it because someone else writes about it and then that person gets the link back, but you kind of get lost in the the rigmarole of it. So like it's hard for someone who's newer. I mean, it's still possible, but someone newer to get really kind of get any sort of traction. And I know something I find really frustrating in the YouTube world is people look at your sub count and it doesn't happen all the time, but there are people who are like, I don't want to work with that person because they're such a small channel. You know, what do I have to gain from this? And it's more so like I've always viewed it as good content is good content. Everyone started at zero or, you know what I mean? So you're working on it. If there's someone who provides value for your audience, why not, if you could give them a platform and maybe boost them, you know, I I think like what Rising Tide raises all ships, right? As opposed to, you know, clicking, battling for clicks. You know, it's always great. Like I would love to work with people who maybe be new, but have great content because you just sometimes just need an opportunity. Absolutely. And definitely in the points and miles world where I feel like if you're very small, you can talk about some of those secret things like manufacturer spending or something else that you won't find on a lot of the bigger blogs. Because if a large blog talks about a new manufacturer spending technique, that technique disappears overnight because everybody's going to jump on it. Where if you're following somebody on Instagram that has 500 or so followers, they're going to have a lot more of that juicier content. It's just harder to find those people. I try to feature a lot of those people on this podcast and then you can go to their channels and then see what they talk about. But I completely understand what you're saying where somebody's looking at Instagram follower count and saying, oh, well, this person has 50,000 followers, whereas this one only has 9,000 or something. So clearly the 50,000 follower person knows what they're doing more. Right. Not necessarily. Agree 100%. And I would feel, I kind of feel there's some... It's going to be sound like I'm throwing shade, but it's not. Like there are some creators I see who I'm like, they do all right. Like they're not the best. I see some creators from like that person's got a thousand subs and their content is fantastic. They deserve a hundred thousand plus subs. Like how can, you know, my audience isn't huge. I'm about 18,500 right now. So like if I can, my small audience, if I can help someone with a thousand, like that's a win I feel like for me because I want to make sure my audience gets the best content possible because I'm just one person. So, you know, good content's good content. 
Yeah, you're fighting the good fight with yeah. the collaborations. I am very much not for the like anti collab life. Where it's like, oh, just can't let my audience find any other audience because I, I might use their. I link. am the only content creator you need to watch. Just me and no one else. Just so you guys know, everybody else who I featured on this podcast, I am the one that yeah, you should <laughs> Yeah, some people are like that. I am not. I also really like having other people to link to and I'm just tired of answering questions sometimes. We all just at some point run into a day where we're tired of answering questions from people and we all want to be helpful, but sometimes we're just not available for personal reasons or something else. And it's nice to have friends who you can just say, ask this guy. Yeah, or because like there's all there's only so many ways we can review the Chase Sapphire Reserve. Everyone, ha- like it, when you review the same card, like a new drops, Everyone's talking about the platinum card updates. Everyone's talking about this. Chase is coming up with some updates in August. We're going to talk about that at nauseum when it happens. But if you someone already has and you're like, that's good, don't reinvent the wheel. Like, kick it over to them. Like, link a video, link a podcast, link something so they could get that information if you haven't done it already or you're not planning to. And it's it's okay not to. For sure. All right. So you had that collaboration and then you grew yes. your podcast. For anybody who's, or sorry, you agree your YouTube. For anybody who's not familiar with your YouTube channel, yeah. what kind of content will they find on there? So a lot of my content, I feel like I'm aimed for almost like the everyday traveler, if you will, not necessarily aspirational awards. It's because just from what I've come to know from my audience, very few people actually do that. They want to do that. But when you're traveling with a family of three, four, five, where you have low spending to really earn enough points consistently to travel like that is unattainable for a lot of people. So I give very honest and direct credit card review. I've done award booking demonstrations in the past, kind of tell people how to use their points the best way possible. Credit card comparisons, I'm really big in credit card comparisons because that's something we're always looking at. Which one's better for this thing or that? So for me, it's just a lot of everyday, general run-of-the-mill information for, I I would call them like the the everyday traveler. Do you record all of your videos from your office or do you also do on location videos if your family's taking vacation and you're like, oh, here's our hotel. Check out our hotel. I, I do both. So I do, you know, hey, here's my hotel. If I'm traveling, I do a lot of Airbnb stays when I'm traveling internationally. So I'll bring my camera and my microphone and shoot when I'm there. Although that drives my wife insane when I do that. She's like, can you just leave the camera at home? I was like, no, I got to record. So I do do I do shoot my videos on site as well. What is the best trip that you've ever gotten to take on points and miles? And can we find a video of it on your YouTube? Hey, everybody. Quick life update. I got a new job. I recently accepted a position as a senior actuarial consultant, and I am so excited to earn more points and miles the old-fashioned way with business travel. Also, though, this means I'm going to have to cut back on the number of one-on-one coaching calls that I have available each month. If you would like to grab one of the limited spots, check out the link in the show notes. Also, I give away one free one-on-one coaching call each week. The secret link to sign up is in my weekly newsletter, which goes out every Monday and is first come, first serve to grab the call. Also, also, I'm going to start reserving 30 minutes of each month's masterclass for group coaching. Even if you're a beginner and try to ask questions in front of everyone, all you need to do is type out your question and you will get a response from a room full of experts. You can find links to sign up for the newsletter, monthly masterclasses, and Patreon, which gets you access to the masterclasses and also recordings of all past events in the show notes. This week's Patreon shout out goes out to Sarah. Thank you so much for being a part of the GeoBreeze Travel Patreon community. I mean, best points and miles. I I would say there's probably two. One was surprising my mother-in-law with a trip to Hawaii. So that was like a big like bucket list goal for her. And for me, it was really great because my wife wanted to take her for the longest time. So we earned a bunch of miles. We flew, I used Singapore Chris Flyer miles to fly United Economy because there was no business class safe, uh, space at the time to Hawaii from, the, from Boston. On the way home, I had enough American Airline miles that we flew business class at least from Hawaii back to San Francisco on Hawaiian Airlines when they had that partnership. And then like we flew like first class, which is big comfy coach chair the way home from on American Airlines. That's one of them. My other one was probably going to the check for IVF for, you know, trying to have our first son who who we we do have just because points and miles made that entirely out of pocket, you know, cost zero. 
for the airfare and our long, long-term long stay in a, a flat there. That is incredible. Tell us more about this trip and why you went to the Czech Republic and also how you booked this. Yeah, so um, my wife and I were trying to have kids for years. We couldn't. You know, We ran into some issues. We were looking here in the United States, and for anyone who is going through infertility, you know the I'm sure you've seen the or people have seen the cost of it. It's like twenty five or thirty thousand dollars per round. It can be more in some locations. For that includes medications, procedures. So it's really expensive in a lot of locations to do that. Not everyone can afford that. My mother in law worked with some people up in the area where we, where we live who actually flew to the check for IVF. So we were like, let's pick their brains on this because we want to know more. And the cost over in the Czech, which the clinic was great. The doctors were very knowledgeable. They speak you know, 20 different languages. So it's not just, you know, U.S. and, you know, speaking Czech. It was like $4,000 out the door. So for the procedure that included everything with medication, so you're talking, what, one, one-fifth to one-eighth the cost. So if it wasn't successful round one, which is a real possibility for people, you could do it again and still be saving yourself some money. As for booking it, I actually booked us two one ways. First, I used Singapore Chris Flyer Miles to fly from Boston over to Vienna. And then we took the train from Vienna to Brno, which is where the IVF clinic was. And I chose Singapore Chris Flyer Miles because there was the potential we would need to change flights depending on whatever the clinic needed from us. And Singapore, Singapore Airlines has a very favorable change fee if you needed to. So while I may have given up some cent per point value, if you will, I gained a little bit more flexibility, which I actually had to use. Then on the way home, I had us on American Airlines, but then I upgraded us because I had a bunch of miles to burn to business class on the way home on their 777. So really nice seat to lay down and just kind of relax on. And then for our accommodations in Brno, I booked a two-week stay using Capital and Venture Miles through Hotels.com for like $1,000. But I had enough miles between the cards that I'd opened to where we paid zero. That is an incredible trip. And I like the story behind it too. Uh, you guys are going through fertility treatments and this is just a creative solution to be able to do that. It's so much more affordable outside of the United States because I think a lot of people just look at points and miles and they're like, let's take a fancy vacation to Paris or let's do the the rounds in Tokyo or something like that. But it can help with some real life just challenges that people Absolutely. have. So, I mean, that was great for us because uh, we saved so much money. We got to enjoy our travels while we were there. Burner was beautiful. We had to spend about four or five days in Vienna because we had to do some waiting, which was great too. So we kind of got to combine our enjoyment of travel with the hopes of having, you know, kids, which we were able to, fortunately. So all in all, like that there, like, I couldn't think of a better use for my points and miles. If that was like the last time I could have used points and miles, like it'd be sad, but like it was, it was a great use to, to use points and miles. Yeah. I don't think a lot of people even think of saying, oh, points and miles, let us start a family, which yeah. like, maybe could have been unattainable price-wise in the United States. So I think the, the different possibilities of what kind of life you can have with points and miles versus what kind you might not be able to have if you didn't have points and miles is truly an incredible thing to think about. Totally agree. Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing story. I think that's probably one of the more incredible stories that we Thanks. have heard on the channel. So where have you guys traveled recently? Any cool trips that you've gotten to take with the kids on points and miles? Nothing recently. Thanks, COVID. So we actually had uh, last year, pre-COVID, I went to Ireland with some friends of mine, went over to Dublin. And then right around when COVID hit, I had a trip booked to go to Bucharest and Krakow. And then we had to cancel that because like they shut down the borders. Since then, we've done a couple like small local trips, going to see family like in New Hampshire, staying here in Maine. But most recently, I've booked myself. I'm going to FinCon this year in Austin. As I think you're speaking. I think I saw you're speaking. That's so all I'll be looking forward. So I'm going to FinCon in September. I come back for five days and I'm heading over to Portugal with a buddy of mine. So I get to pick up a little bit of travel, like some, you know, 
FinCon business stuff and then go and do some enjoyment in a very short period of time. We're looking to do some shorter travel, maybe like DC or New York with the kids, uh, maybe go to Boston as well. Just trying to get back out there. Pre-COVID though, we were traveling still every couple of months with our oldest and he was just traveling internationally like a boss. But now, now he's now he's running around like a savage at times, like a little savage animal, rabbit animal. So I'm not sure how you do on a plane. So <laughs> how old is he? He's two and a half. He's in that like super fun phase, but I don't know. I think he'd last very long on a long haul right now. That's that's most humans where you're like, and it's been six hours and I'm about done with this. Yeah. How much alcohol can I drink in the back of the plane? Yep. <laughs> Sometimes kids are just really fascinated by the TV screen on an airplane, though, where they're like, there's so many movies. Yeah, he's he would travel very, very well. So I think I'm I'm definitely exaggerating being dramatic a bit. He'd be perfectly fine, I think, if we needed him to be. But it's been a while, which is why I think we want to do some shorter travels to see kind of how he acts back on a plane before we even consider doing some sort of long haul. And especially with how things are slowly starting to reopen. I'd really hate to book a family trip and go through some, what well, seems like some nightmare for people to get their miles back in their account. So just being more cautious on booking, not necessarily for any particular reason outside of, I don't necessarily want to deal with the hassle of 13 hours with Delta to get some miles back in my account. Yeah, that struggle is real. Especially if you're so going bad through, people. Especially if you're going through Chase portals or Amex portals, or like if you're ever using third parties, then... It's it's a hassle. It is a real hassle, as I'm sure 90% of people know by now. And what's really sad, I think, is that you know these banks, the Sapphire Reserve, 1.5 cents per point, use your business platinum for 35% back. But this hassle for people, like, are these portals long-term, are they going to feel comfortable booking them again? Because I have heard just some horror stories from people getting their miles back or getting a hold of someone who can help them and going through some pretty interesting restrictions or criteria to get their miles back in the situation. Yep. I have also heard horror stories. So I prefer transfer partners. Everybody has their own style, but yeah, the horror stories are real. Yes. Well, you have shared some amazing knowledge with us today about how to grow YouTube why you should not manufacture spend a whole bunch of money that you can't afford to lose and the really amazing story of getting to go to the check on points and miles so that you could start a family so with all the knowledge that you have amassed about points and miles what would you say is your best piece of advice for people today that i can put on an instagram quote card i would tell someone who's just starting out they wouldn't start slow start slow have a goal and work backwards i think that is some of if I think sometimes we get captivated by the headlines of 100,000 points, you know, first class to the Maldives, these ex- extravagant headlines, and people want all of that right now. And they don't necessarily realize at the point in time when they're just starting that people who are doing this or have been doing it for years, we have systems in place. We understand how we're going to meet our minimum spend requirements. We have backup methods in case those fail. We've learned a lot over the course of time. And if you're starting, getting started, it's okay to start with one card, hit the bonus, take some time to figure it out and move on. But really just starting slow and having a goal and working backwards. Excellent advice. And speaking of excellent advice, can you give a shout out to somebody else on the internet who others should follow for great points and miles advice? Yeah, I I think if you're into travel and beer, which I feel like they almost go hand in hand, I would definitely look at Jeff, uh, Jeff over at Miles and Pints. And like at this point, you know, we're recording this, he's over in Dublin right now, and I'm following him on Instagram, and I'm like, I'm a little a little envious. Like I was there a couple of, like what last year, but I'm envious because like he's looks like he's having a great time. I love Jeff's Instagram, mostly for the food photos. Okay, so like. I'm not that into beer. I'm really into miles, obviously. Yeah. But I um, have such good food photos. And uh, so, especially the cheese pulls. I love the cheese pulls. The cheese pulls. pulls are great. He came up. So he was up here in Maine a couple months ago. And he came up here to Bangor, where outside Bangor, where I live. And like he was setting up his beer for like this perfect Instagram shot. And it came out so good. I took my photo and I'm like, why does my look like 
like it was like some my kid took it and yours looks like a pro took it like he just sets it all up really good it looks great like he just he just takes great instagram photos yes his food photos are some of my favorites they and are. i will definitely have to have him on the show sometime most definitely but, so where can we find you on the internet so you'll find me on Instagram and on at pretty much Twitter as well at, at Waller's Wallet. I have a Facebook group as well. It's everything's Waller's Wallet. And then my YouTube channel, which is where I post. I'm currently posting every week. I've kind of slowed down for a bit of time just because I'm hanging out with the family, enjoying myself a little bit more. And being up to one in the morning, editing and recording isn't necessarily great for sleep habits with two young kids. So YouTube at Waller's Wallet as well is where you find a bulk of my content. And you release one new episode per week? Uh, One to two. Right now it's about one. One every Friday, but sometimes it's up to two. That's awesome. Definitely check out your YouTube and all of your other channels as well. I know that we've chatted on Instagram, so go follow Dustin. Well, thanks, Dustin, so much for coming on to the show today. It was so great getting to hear all of your different points and mile stories. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Of course. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of the GeoBreeze Travel Podcast. If any of the cards mentioned in today's episode piqued your interest, please check out the links in the show notes for more information on any of the cards. Also, if you apply for a card using the links on that page, I may receive a commission too, so please and thank you. P.S. I hear the links work better in Internet Explorer or Safari, and sometimes the credit card applications tend to glitch out in Chrome. Additionally, it would mean the world to me if you could subscribe to this podcast leave a five-star review, and share it with a friend. And if you would like to make even more travel hacking friends, please sign up for the Patreon to access our monthly masterclass hangouts. We dive deep into a particular points program each month, and you'll get to ask all of your travel hacking questions and enjoy being around other people who enjoy points and miles just as much as you and I do. If you would like an invite to the next one, head over to geobreezetravel.com hangouts to sign up to be on the invite list. Take care and happy travels!